and I'm a licensed professional counselor and sex therapist in Erie, Pennsylvania. And today I want to talk about minor attracted persons. And I want to talk about minor attracted persons because they are probably the most vilified population of folks in our culture. And most folks are making incorrect assumptions about them without actually knowing much about them. And those assumptions create harm for an already marginalized population. You may have noticed that I'm using the term minor attracted persons. Oh, we noticed. abbreviated to MAPS. No, we know that. Instead of the more commonly used term pedophile. And I'm doing this because the term pedophile has moved from being a diagnostic label to being a judgmental, hurtful insult that we hurl at people in order to harm them or slander them. I also prefer person-first language that recognizes that any label we might apply to a person is only part of who they are. And does okay, and we're, we're going to start this again, and we're going to we're going to parse through this a little bit. Um, first of all, whenever you come across videos like this on the interwebs, there could be some context missing. One does not know necessarily who this individual is. Is she a reputable, what did she say she was? I'm a licensed professional counselor and sex therapist. A licensed professional counselor and sex therapist who seems to be purporting to have expertise in maps. Minor attracted persons. Listen to this. In Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh, and today I want to talk about minor attracted persons. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about minor attracted persons because they are probably the most vilified population of folks in our culture. And most folks are making incorrect assumptions about them. Most folks are making incorrect assumptions about minor attracted persons. Um, it's not an assumption. It's in the definition that these are individuals who are attracted to minor persons. Now, I can appreciate there's going to be a semantics debate. When does one become the big P word? Is it by virtue of thoughts or by virtue of action? And I'm going to say this not to compare the gay community to maps in spirit or in essence at all. This is the argument that was once upon a time used uh, for homosexuality, for being gay. What is being gay? Is it the thoughts or is it the action? Now, I know from a religious perspective, there's a distinction that people draw between the thought and the action. And they say, you're, you, you may have the thoughts, but you're not the thing until you act on it. Um, and the reason I make the comparison is because we're not far, people, from having people like this insist on adding the M to the LGBTQAI plus two now for the exact same reasons that gays fought for gay rights. They said, it's it, first of all, it's our decision. It affects no one but ourselves. Not exactly the same argument with maps, uh, but we're entitled to think what we want and you can't judge us for it. Was right when the conduct affected only the person having the thoughts or two consenting adults. But now the argument is going to be, you can't punish maps for what they think, but only if they act on it. Setting aside all the stats on that, it's going to be a matter of time before there's going to be a push to have M added to the LGBTQAI+. And I wonder how the communities who fought long and hard for rights, which affected them and only them and consenting adults, are going to turn off a whole lot of people. Um, and they're marginalized maps are marginalized. How about people who are, who have fantasies about non-consensual sex? There's a word for it. Let's call them raps, blank, uh, 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 attracted people. They, they're, they're marginalized people who fantasize about R-A-P-E. They're, they're, they're marginalized. No, it's called criminalized because it's criminal activity. And if someone's marginalized for criminal activity or thoughts of criminal activity or impulsion, compulsion to commit criminal activity, that's not called marginalized. Marginalized are people with beliefs that affect only themselves that are discriminated against. Okay, uh, intro over. I think we only have a, a, a 45 minutes with, it's Dace, by the way. I know it. 
I've been doing my homework on, on Steve all day and it's been good. Uh, I think this is going to be a spicy sidebar. Steve Dace got a podcast uh, on the blaze. I've been boning up on as much as I could hear today. And um, I want to read the book, The Fourth Reich. We're going to talk about it all. Steve, get ready. I'm bringing you in. Standard disclaimers, everybody. No legal advice, yada, yada, yada. We don't have the time. We're doing it. Steve, sir. Hey. How, how goes the battle? Uh, bloody. Just like I like it, brother. How about you? Well, good. I'm telling you, sir, I, I, I do my homework, but I typically do it the day of. I've been listening to as much as I could cram in in a day. I didn't get to your older books. But my goodness, I, I think I'm going to enjoy listening to them on Audible. I hope they're on Audible. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, Barnes is going to be here in a few minutes. Uh, I know your time is short tonight. 30,000 foot overview as to who you are, how you got to where you are, before we start talking about a little bit more detail of your history, but then coming into the present because you're making waves in the present. Barnes is here. I'm going to bring him in right now. Elevator pitch for those who don't know who you are. Who are you? Sure. Uh, I'm a kid born to a 15-year-old mom uh, who got pregnant with me. Uh, right at the dawn of Roe v. Wade and uh, seriously pondered about having a safe, legal and rare abortion. Uh, she decided to give birth to me. And I mean, we were on government cheese, ADC, reduced lunches, WIC, all that stuff. Government cheese isn't that bad, by the way. Just want everybody to know. The government orange juice sucks. So never drink that, though. That's terrible. OK, um, uh, you know, and uh, she ended up marrying my stepdad where I got my last name. Uh, she met him while he was enlisted in the Navy. And there were times he was a great dad. Uh, there were times he was very abusive. We moved a lot. So, you know, growing up in that environment and moving a lot, you learn to get by on not a lot of approval and affirmation for people or from people, I should say, which perfectly prepared me for what I do now, uh, which uh, which is uh, re requires not needing a lot of affirmation from people and not caring about making enemies. And long story short, I, I got lucky. You know, I started off doing sports talk and sports writing. Uh, here in the local newspaper. Uh, I just, throughout the course of my career, I've literally, I, I got into radio when a local radio owner called me out of the blue and asked me if I wanted a job. Every job I've ever had in this business, someone called me out of the blue and asked me if I wanted to have a job. Even national work, I've not applied for like any jobs. They've all just been called out of the blue with people I did not previously known. I know. And so from my, you know, worldview perspective as a dreaded evangelical, I just kind of view this as kind of a God's plan thing. And so, um, I, you know, I play poker all in every hand, uh, whether we're due seven offsuit or a pair of aces, I'm playing with house money. I, my mom should have aborted me 49 years ago now. And so I don't have much to lose whatsoever. I just live in Iowa with my wife and kids, pretty simple life. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I like making demons sweat. That's what I do. What was it like, uh, the early days of talk radio when you were there? It was a lot different uh, than what it is, uh, what it is right now. Um, there was, you know, the whole Overton window phrase. Um, there was kind of this accepted, you know, left to right of center uh, of what the talking points and everything were. There was still this idea that, you know, 40 percent of the country were Republicans, 40 percent were Democrats and the other 20 percent were in the middle. You know, the 80s, 90s team GOP model. And so, you know, your goal was to try to, you know, uh, preach to that 40 percent that was on your the right, while at the same time not alienating that 20 percent that you were supposed to, you know, help to win over. When I when I took over from sports, sports was a blast. I mean, you could just say and do whatever you wanted. You could insult people. No one cared. No one took it seriously. Um, you know, and, uh, and but when I took over a news talk, there was still a reasonable expectation that you would be a mouthpiece for the Republican Party. I, I think I ended that in about five minutes on my first show. Uh, and, and I, I, I just, I, I think what helped was being younger. You know, I just turned 49 when I started in this business, when I got my own show in sports, I was 26 years old. I got my own show in sports in a top 100 market when I was 26. I got, I got moved to, uh, to news talk on a 50,000 watt award-winning radio station in a top 100 market when I was 33. And I think that perspective of not necessarily being tied to a kind of nostalgia about an era that either never really existed or certainly does not now. Uh, I just, you know, I'll give you one example, Robert. I think you'll appreciate that might be a little insider-ish, but we'll kind of answer your question for you. When, when WHO is a station that's won all kinds of Marconi Awards. Uh, it's one of the most successful mid-market uh, stations in the country. Ronald Reagan was our very first sports director, has a huge uh, tradition in the business. And, and with Iowa and its agriculture base, 
it, it really didn't have to sell. I mean, it just had a guaranteed clientele, the port council, the egg council, you know, hey, the ethanol, hey, how much are you buying this year? You weren't actually selling people, you're just taking orders. All of a sudden I come in and I'm just slaying chivalrous, man. I mean, we're just laying, we're just taking ordinance, okay, and taking names. And and our ratings blew through the roof in afternoon drive. And we were doing like nine or 10 shares overall. And so the ratings were incredible, but a lot of those, uh, you know, big ag people did not want to buy ads in the show because they were all team GOP establishment hacks. And so we actually had to go hire younger salespeople who didn't have any of those previous relationships, but all they cared was, and they didn't even like agree with me. All right. They were like, we don't care, dude. He's got a 10 share in the afternoon. Do you want to buy a spot or not? No, cool. We're going to the next person. Like the, the, the paradigm shift of my show forced us to totally change the way we even sold the radio show at that time. And so I, I just think being someone who has been, you know, uh, on the younger end uh, of this from the beginning, uh, as I've moved kind of up the ladder and God's opened a lot of doors, it's just I've been involved in a lot of paradigm shifts. And now now I feel like the paradigm has almost caught up to me. Uh, and, and so now I, I don't feel I'm nearly as, as often radicalizing my audience or wondering if I overly, if I've pushed them beyond what I think they're capable of. I think they've almost caught up now. Certainly the events of the other night at Mar-a-Lago didn't hurt with that effort whatsoever. The events of the last 28 months of what I call COVID stand has, has helped with that. And so I think the audience now has just about caught up. And along the way, you know, I'm an activist. I've specifically used my show to win elections from school board to president. I, I was a strategist for the Ted Cruz for president campaign. I've worked on campaigns. I've done professional polling. So I've done the nuts and bolts of politics that a lot of guys in our business have not done. And, and that also has helped equip me to understand how much our people are lied to about how pro the process really works, how the system really works. And it's really all done to devise so that they don't really know how much influence they can actually wield over the process. And so over the years, I've, I've tried to educate my audience of how to truly break down polls, how to point out when one is a fake, when one is a push, to look at analytics, those sorts of things, to try to make them smarter consumers of political media too. Steve, I'm going to ask only two questions about childhood. Your mother was 15 when she had you. Mm -hmm. The two questions are, when did you find out that she had contemplated terminating the pregnancy? And what's it like literally having a mother that I, I presume oftentimes you were asked, is this your sister? Is this your girlfriend sure. type thing? What type? Of, yeah. So when did you when did you find out? And what's that like growing up? I didn't find that out till I was like 16. I mean, when I, I didn't even know that Dave Dace was not my biological father till I was in the sixth grade. I, we moved around so much. And so one day we go to this school. We had settled down finally in Michigan. And that's why, you know, I'm in my amazing blue man cave here uh, this evening. We had settled down at uh, Gladiola Elementary School in Wyoming, Michigan. And the first day of, of uh, it's a suburb of Grand Rapids. And the first day of roll, the teacher in the class kept asking for Stephen Wright. I don't know who the hell that is. I didn't answer. You know, finally, they, they, we go out to recess and she grabs me by the shoulder and says, young man, why didn't you answer me when I called your name? And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you didn't ask for Steve Dace. She goes, well, I don't have a Steve Dace on my role. I have a Stephen Wright. I, we just thought it was the weirdest thing. Like, what? That's my mom's maiden name. Why'd they go by that? My mom was a nurse. So my mom, after having me, actually got back, went back to school, got her GED, went to nursing college, became an RN, really became a successful medic, uh, healthcare professional. She's retired now. And um, um, I came home and she was home that day doing the dishes. And I said, mom, strangest thing happened today at school. And I told her what the teacher did. And my mom just broke down and started crying like on the spot. And I'm like, I'm sorry, mama. What did I do? I didn't understand. And that's when she told me the story that Dave was not my biological father and that uh, my biological father was somebody that I wouldn't remember, barely knew, barely understood. And it was when I was 16 that I and we we moved back to Iowa for a year. And that's where my mom grew up. And uh, I sought him out, found out that uh, his family were very prominent uh, a Democrat uh, activists and politicians here in the community. My uncle was on the city council. His dad, my grandfather, was a judge. And, uh, and, it's, and it's at that point that my mom told me the rest of the story. I mean, when I was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, I couldn't have told you what an abortion was. I, I had no idea what it was. Don't even remember hearing the term, you know? And so I didn't learn about this until I was a teenager. And it's funny, you're the first person that's ever asked me what it was like I remember going, my mom taught me how to roller skate. And for a while, I was actually really good as a kid. 
you know, and and she get carded for cigarettes and booze and, and beer and stuff. And so it was people who thought I was hanging out with my sister. We had a tradition in, in our home that uh, once a school year, if I kept my grades up, mom would come in and get me out of school early and take me out, you know, to get ice cream or to go see a movie. Like one year, I remember going to see Big with Tom Hanks. And we would walk in. And as I got older, people were like, is this a May, December situation? <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, it's my mama. You know, so um, we've always been very, very close. Uh, we literally grew up together. And, uh, you know, um, I love her to death. Now, in turn, what was it like going from talk radio into the live streaming, uh, the, the video, the YouTube, the blaze, that media space? You know, the biggest change for me, uh, Robert, was w w in radio, you know, first of all, if you're any kind of broadcaster, you are taught, you're the music, basically, you fill the time. And so you're kind of trained to talk to fill the time. And and so when you're doing syndicated radio, like I was for Salem, uh, and, and uh, you know, and it's, it's, it, it's at night, and so everything's going to be automated, you know, on, you know, 90 stations across the country, and maybe three of them have a live body there. And so if you keep talking while they go to break they're just going to break it's automated like there's a great historian it's a fun guest named bill federer and i knew i knew the but bill would give you like nine minute answers to every question and so i would sit there and like in my head do i have time to ask him a second question or not <laughs> can i chance it because bill will just keep talking and like the liner would run you go to break then i start doing a lot of tv i, I did a lot of stuff for msnbc as a token conservative when uh, I was first getting started and to kind of get my name out there, but I also wanted to test what I believe up against them. You know, I, I wanted to see if it was true that there were really no good reasons to believe what they believe. And I got to tell you, after about 60 appearances on their channel, I discovered there's really no good reasons to believe what they believe. That's what I discovered. And, uh, and so now I've got a, now I'm out, I'm, I'm doing these segments where we're doing these eight minute round tables and the way that a round table in MSNBC works, there's a left wing host, three left wing guests and you. And it's in eight and a half minutes and they will either go first to you and they set you up to lose or go last to you after everybody else has spoken. And so now all of a sudden I've got to figure out how do I talk and get this all out in like a minute or two. Right. Tops. Well, now we go into podcasting and it's very open ended. You know, we have like 30 minute segments, 18 minute segments uh, on the show on Blaze TV. And and, and so um, I actually I know it sounds weird uh, if you know me at all. I actually had to learn how to talk more again after being so regimented, both in syndicated radio uh, and then being on doing so much stuff on cable news. Um, but the, the thing that it's a trade off. I, I miss the in instant interaction of syndicated radio and callers and everything to some degree. But we, you make up for it now that we can really get in depth with people and treat them like adults and truly break a topic down and and have a very serious conversation about it. And so I think, especially as I get older, I think I probably would I would rather have that trade-off. Uh, when did you get big into the political side as opposed to the sports side? What, what year was that, give or take? So I was always big into politics. I was an Alex B. Keaton wannabe as a kid. Dave was a big Democrat union steward guy. And 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 so I rebelled against my, my stepdad, who was kind of a, a, a stoner guy growing up, grease monkey type union guy. Uh, I became a jock and a good student and a Republican just to basically re that, that I re I'm a contrarian. That's how I rebelled. <laughs> OK. And so I was always very heavily into politics. I did college Republicans. Um, I was always very much into it and, uh, on my sports show. When I went, Iowa State were not in season. You no, know, no one wanted cared about talking about baseball and stuff in Iowa in June, July and August. So, I mean, I would talk about what was going on in the community. Uh, and so it was it was always kind of a natural transition. And they they were always grooming me when I went to work for the Clear Channel Sports Station. Well, it's iHeart now from the day from day one. They always were grooming me to take over on WHO. And then, you know, one day a rival company literally offered me a blank check to leave uh, iHeart and go to them. And that was uh, that turned out to be the perfect motivation to get iHeart to finally agree and, and have me make the switch uh, to, to News Talk Radio. And that was in 2006. And I didn't really understand at first the power of the medium and the power that WHO is the only statewide media outlet in the first in the nation caucus state. I really didn't understand it until the first Iowa straw poll in 2007. And I had gotten to know Mike Huckabee very well. I'd gotten to know Mitt Romney too well. And I mean, I, I had spent the summer basically annihilating his campaign. And most of it was in his own words, clips. 
you know, this was new in 2007, taking clips and stuff of people, video and stuff and replaying it and using it against them. And, and I mean, I had years of stuff to just destroy Mitt Romney with. And we had Mike Huckabee on my show all the time. He had no money. He was thinking about dropping out before we even got to the straw poll. Then we get to the straw poll and they run out of tickets and do so well. He finishes a close second place. And that's when I began to realize, oh, wait, we can actually move an agenda here. We, we can have an impact here. My, my general manager, the day after the 2008 Iowa caucuses, when Huckabee pulled the big upset, he called me into his office the next morning and he had on his desk, he had a, the coverage map of WHO, where we're strong in the state. And, 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 you know, if you split Iowa into thirds, WHO is very strong in the middle third of the state. And so did you actually hear WHO better in Minneapolis than you do in, say, Sioux City, Iowa? OK, and so he 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 put he put out the coverage map of HO and then he put over the top of it the county by county map for the Iowa caucuses the night before. And it, with one exception, with one county exception, it was an exact replica where Huckabee won is where I was on the air. And that and, and then, you know, you know, I've got publications calling me now and Fox does a feature. I, I think it was Byron York when he was at National Review at the time. It was one of those guys that the Romney campaign had told that my show was worth $2 million in oppo research alone and taking him out. And that's when I was like, you know what, this is a fully, uh, you know, armed and operational battle station here. I mean, we, we don't have to just pontificate. We can give orders. We can generate outcomes. And so that was that, that really taught me that we can move an audience provided I maintain my integrity and credibility and don't become a hack for people. Okay. And so we did that for school board, we did that for legislature. It got to the point after a, a, a couple of years, I actually started helping to recruit my own state legislative candidates. We were writing commercials, helping them find polling. We kind of ran a shadow party. I mean, and, and we never got to the point of Democrats trying to take me out. The Republicans tried to get me fired all the time. But our ratings were too good that they they couldn't do it. And then after the the midterms in 2010 and Iowa became the first state in American history, to fire state Supreme Court justices by popular referendum, and it was over the marriage issue. Uh, I had a group of Christian businessmen who were big Rush Limbaugh fans, and they knew how Rush got started, that a couple of successful businessmen found this guy in a market about the size of Des Moines, Sacramento, California. They're like, hey, man, we're going to put the money around you, take you out to New York and see if, if, if the rest of the country sees what we see in you. And so these Christian businessmen came to me, and they were like, we've seen the impact you've had in Iowa. And we're wondering if we put a, do a similar model around you, if, if maybe you could have a, an impact on a more national basis. But I, but I wanted to do it. I wanted to take things. I wanted to build on what Rush did. I, you know, Rush made conservatism mainstream again in America. I wanted to take a biblical worldview and make it mainstream in America again. And just let the, you know, the old, uh, you know, the old line from Charles Hayden Spurgeon, I would defend the Bible no more than I'd defend a caged lion. Simply let the lion out of its cage and it will defend itself just fine. OK, and, and so that's the number one prime directive of our show. More than election outcomes or anything else is is to is to use the talents and gifts God has given me and the platform we have to bring the a biblical worldview, the, the worldview that the pilgrims took with them when they landed at Plymouth Rock, the worldview that led to the Great Awakenings to bring that back into the mainstream of America again, and just let it into the arena. I don't think it's you know my or anybody else's job to win the argument for a biblical worldview, just to represent it. And I think it'll do just fine on its own. Now, before we transition into uh, to your uh, new book, just two other biographical questions. One is, where did you learn to speak so well? Like people often ask me that, and it's like, I grew up with a bunch of older siblings that were in theater. I was in theater, extemporaneous speaking competitions, all of that. But where did you learn to speak so well? And second, was your religious background part of your youth or was it something that came later on in life? Um, the, to the first question, uh, you know, I've just always been like this. You know, some people, God made seven feet tall. Some of them he gave, you know, 4.2 40-yard dashes, okay? Um, you know, I, I can't dunk a ball, basketball, let alone palm one. This I can do. You know, I've always been able to talk well. I've always been able to absorb mass quantities of information and recall it very fast. Those are just areas that I can't take credit for. I was just gifted like that. You know, I, I taught myself to read with comic books in the back of cereal boxes uh, by the time I was three years old, you know, watching the electric company because Spider-Man was on. It's just kind of always been like this for me. Um, and uh, in terms of spirituality, like a lot of American homes, 
you know, we believed in the Ten Commandments and, uh, the, and, the, and the Constitution. So we thought we were Christians, what Lincoln used to call uh, America's civil religion. Every now and then, um, you know, we would do the whole Christmas and Easter thing, but we weren't really serious about it. It really wasn't until 30 years old. I was at a Promise Keepers event in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, on September 18th, 2003. And at that point in time, that's uh, when God decided once and for all, uh, he needed to confront me uh, and deal with me. And my wife will tell you that uh, she's been on her second marriage ever since then. Just so happens that the guy has the same name both times. Uh, fantastic. Uh, no, I, we, we have to get into the book. Uh, it's called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. It's, it is now your fourth book that you've published, Steve? I think it's actually our sixth that we have published, I think. Um, and now the name is self-explanatory, but before we even get into the, the, the book itself, I think you need to debrief everyone to the extent that we can. Robert will probably want to say something as well. It's called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. We yeah. all know the Third Reich, which was <laughs> Hitler's Reich. Uh, are, are you able to debrief everyone as to what the First and Second Reich were and how this fits into... I mean, people don't even appreciate. The Third Reich implies there were two more before it, can you contextualize that for those who may not have even asked the question before? I could. It's 626. That is a long, <laughs> that is a long, um, that's a long historical contextual conversation. Um, I, I, if you, if you don't mind, I, I could make it briefer and, and by applying it to, and you know, if you guys are fine with it, my small group can wait 15 minutes. Let's go to the top of the hour. They'll be cool with it. If you guys are okay with it. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, but um, if you look at, if you look at the pattern of the Third Reich, the first foray into the imposition, you know, and the way this book is structured, it is structured like a Nuremberg trial. We did that on purpose. We, we don't have a table of contents. We have a witness list. We don't have an introduction. We have an opening argument. All right. The opening argument is 40 pages. There are 82 footnotes in the opening argument alone. OK, we will bring receipts. You can you bring it. We are up for the challenge. All right. We, we want, bring me, bring us your tired, your poor, your censors, bring us your propaganda. We are anxious for this fight. In fact, we are begging you for it. One of the reasons why we started pre-sales so early today for a book that doesn't come out till February, well, one is in the Let's Go Brandon economy, um, supply chains for hardcover books can be difficult, okay? And then if you sell out, it's it could go months before you can replenish. So we kind of wanted to gauge where the market was for it. But there's a second reason that I did not talk about on my show today. I'll, I'll talk to you guys about it. We actually wanted to dare them to censor us. We wanted to dare Amazon to censor us. And that's the other reason why we put the opening argument out for free for everyone to read so that everyone would see what kind of content was coming your way. Because we want to see now if they're going to censor us. Because if they do, we'll just sell this book directly through the Blaze. We'll just put 100,000 copies in the Blaze store, cut Amazon completely out and do it ourselves. But it, but it would be easier to do that if they if we if we dare them now than if they blindside us with a censoring in February. And so that's why we're doing it now. We're kind of we're testing both the market for the book, but also the links of censorship. So far, they've actually not censored a lot of books. They've censored everything else, but we haven't gone Fahrenheit 451 yet. And so this might be the book that does it, though, when you read it. OK. And, and if you look at the one of the witnesses we call in the book is a woman is, a, is one of the last remaining American Holocaust survivors. Vera Sharab is her name. And the interview that we do with Vera, where she lays out exactly the order of events that occurred for her as a little girl in Nazi Germany. And it began with the biomedical fascism. That is where it began. And then it began with the warrants and the roundups like Mar-a-Lago the other night. So we're now at the arrest this man stage of the Cold Civil War. Soon with your 89,000 IRS agents trained with lethal uh, force, we will be at the round them up stage, liens and everything else on people who have wrong think. That is absolutely where this is going to go. And so when we first came up with this title, and, and there's a lot, we draw the parallels between the Third Reich. I mean, my co-owner is whatever the rung of, of Judaism below, but below Hasidic is, that is Daniel. Okay. All right. And so, you know, you couldn't get him on your show on the Sabbath. We, when we did our vaccine special on Blaze TV, he kind of catch a flight 6 a.m. the next morning on a Friday to make sure he got home for the Sabbath, right? So we didn't choose, we, we, I understand, and he certainly understands what we are, the legacy we are calling upon with this title. And, but we, we draw the, 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 the absolute parallels between the two regimes, between the changing of talking points, between the, in, between the invoking of public health into the, into the, into the, into the, the, the Rubicon of tyranny and to make them essentially a delivery mechanism for it and on and on and on and on. And, and 
this is in every respect. A lot of times when people look at historical comparisons, they think that it has to attack the same people for the for the for the comparison to be relevant. No, it's about the form of the attack. Not about the people being attacked. It's about the form of the attack. And the form of the attack here, for goodness sakes, guys, the freaking head of the World Economic Forum's name is Klaus Schwab, guys. Okay. And he, he what's, I mean, we are, that's a freaking Bond villain. I mean, it's like hell is just, you know, run greatest hits albums, not even coming up with original material now. Okay. All of the obvious parallels are there. And that's why we draw them. And that's why we titled the book that way. And the subtitle, I think, is even more important. Confronting COVID fascism with a new Nuremberg trial so this never happens again. Nuremberg and the code that came after it were supposed to prevent what the last 28 months uh, were from ever happening again. And what they're doing, they're still doing. I mean, the study out of, uh, the study out of Thailand today, 18% uh, of the teenage boys they studied had uh, that after a full course of Pfizer, uh, came back with irregular EKGs. These are teenage boys. Denmark, which has been on the vanguard of, of, of transparent information uh, from the beginning of COVID, announcing today it won't even give these vaccines to minors any longer. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Israel. It's weird. In 2021, they had over a 100% increase in new disability certificates in Israel compared to the last three-year trend. I mean, it's a mystery wrapped in a puzzle, it's shrouded by an enigma. It's long COVID, Steve. It's all, it, it depends on how you want to attribute it. Yes. Attribute it. Sorry. Yes, but you're exactly right. And, and, and so we want to stop this. And, and so we, we got the book finished so it could be published this winter when we anticipate there will be a changeover in the U.S. Congress. And between Daniel and I and, and, and the contacts we have, we know several members of Congress. Like I said, I, work, I got a paycheck from one of them who just ran for president. I worked, I reported directly to him. The point of this book is to is to give them a Rosetta Stone. No more Ron Johnson by himself. This no excuses. Here are the witnesses. They're on the record. We've recorded all their conversations. Everybody uses their actual name. We've got people from the military to physicians to doctors to lawyers, every walk of life. People just simply telling the story of their kids denied transplants because they wouldn't take the jab. We we lay it all out. We lay all the data out. We wanted to put the maximum amount of pressure on the quote unquote red wave coming to save us when it takes power in January to act on what is happening and stop it from happening again. Now, uh, when all of this sort of unfolded, you were one of the first quickest voices out there pointing out the problems with the lockdowns, the mandates, the, the bio, the bio health fascism that you're describing that it's incipient nature. Uh, and a lot of people were initially at least on the fence or kind of quiet or, you know, the, what do you think, uh, uh, does it more sort of your populist background? Uh, what is it do you think that gave you the access, or a lot of people in the data community, I mean, people that are apolitical in the data community were, were raising problems right away mm -hmm. just because they knew how to filter data, knew not to just defer to authorities because they're authorities. What, what was it you think in your background, whether it was a long history of data analysis from sports yep. to politics, uh, your, your populist sort of perspective on things, what was it that helped let you spot it in before a lot of other people did. So uh, uh, somebody I really respect in our industry and movement, and I, I'm not going to use their name. I'm, I normally name names because when I don't, then everybody thinks I'm talking about them and I alienate everybody. OK, in this case, I'm not going to name his name, though, because he's brilliant and he's pretty much been right about everything else. So I'm not going to hold this against him. OK, but um, he sent me a DM on the night of March 16th when we just announced the lockdowns. And he said, you know, here's a link to the Imperial College survey. I really think because because I was looking at what was going on in Italy. I was looking at the data of what was going on in Italy. And it just didn't add up to the fanciful uh, narratives that we were being that we were being sold. OK. And and he's like, I really think you need to read this report just to make sure you're not being irresponsible. I said, OK, man, hey, iron sharpens iron. There's wisdom in a multitude council. You know, I don't want to, I'm a critical thinker, so I'll hold my own views up to skepticism. And I, I remember the first time, guys, I read that report and all the fancy charts and graphs and the waves and the big numbers. And I've sat down here in this very man cave in the chair that's right over here next to me. My family's upstairs. And I'm like, you know, it's middle of March. This is March madness. I look forward to this every year. I take time off. And it feels like all of a sudden, like we're never going to have another March madness again. Like I'm, I'm starting to think some really dark ages, bubonic plague, cataclysmic kind of dark thoughts. And I don't, 
I don't, you know, I, I can't tell you, I hear the audible voice of God a lot. Okay. But in the back of my head, I heard a still small voice say to me, you need to Google Imperial College and climate change. So I did. And I found a man named Jeremy Grantham, who is one of the biggest donors to Imperial College. Uh, there's a wing of the university that is named after him there in the UK. Uh, he is one of the richest men in the world. Uh, he's a multi-billionaire. And he's given over 80% of his wealth away to defeat what he calls the, or to win what he calls the, the 250 year war against fossil fuels. You can see where this is going. And what I also found is the wing of the university named after him very shortly after they came out with that infamous model, came out with a supplemental paper that Lordy, wouldn't you know, got like no media. But in this paper, it basically called for the great reset. In this paper, it said, now that the West is shut down, this is now the time to usher in the Green New Deal and so now I'm beginning to smell a rat, okay? And, and now my emotion has subsided, and now I, I can think critically. I go back and I read the study again. And now I'm reading it as a data analyst. Now I'm, and, and, and I, I, I cannot uh, assemble my own algorithm. I, you know, I, I couldn't get into the University of Michigan because my math score on the ACT was too low, okay? But what I, can what I can do is reassemble your BS. I can do that. Because what I think a lot of people don't know, there is data modeling and then there's data analysis. And data analysis begins with the premise of who is the modeler? What's the assumptions they're beginning with? Algorithms are not Skynet. They're not organic. They don't make themselves. Somebody imputes that metric. Somebody imputes that formula. Somebody asks and prompts the question or the result that they're asking for. And that somebody's human. And they have biases. And they're starting from, they're starting from certain assumptions. And, and when you read that report, it's like they admit they don't really know how coronavirus is spread. Well, gee, I don't know. You know, I mean, I didn't have to ace the mass port, math portion of the ACT to think maybe if you don't know how the damn virus is spread, you don't have your model of how it's going to spread socks. Maybe. I don't know. You know, and it was just very clear that this entire thing was full of BS. But then I, I stopped and I thought, you know what, though, this is going to be right wingers against climate change all over again. And, and, and all these, they've got all the academic credentials. Every government is scared. We're going to look like idiots. And you said something very key there, Robert. What blew me away, and this is when I decided, okay, I'm all in, all in, is when, is when I saw the day after the Imperial College survey came out, uh, epidemiologists and people at Oxford, the number one rated university in the world, right away condemning it as a trash model. These guys don't know what they're talking about, how they made this thing up. I was stunned. I didn't know what, what a John Ioannidis at Stanford was. All I know is that's a school I'd never had any chance of getting into. Okay. I, I could not believe the elite level of academics all over the world. Yale, Harvard. Again, these aren't these are places that don't believe that the earth is 7,000 years old. These are places that don't believe that there's only two genders, guys. These, all right. They, they, there's, uh, there's just not a lot of Harvard faculty tuned in, I'm guessing, to the sidebar show here on YouTube tonight. I'm just gonna throw that out there. I'm just gonna, that, that, that's it. I'm sure you guys are great, but I'm just gonna probably profile and say that's probably true, okay? And it's probably true of my show too, all right? And so what I was blown away by was even within their own academic communities, people were calling serious BS on this from a, from a, from a quant, qualitative work standpoint. And that's what gave me the confidence now that it wasn't just, hey, Steve Dace from, from, from the uh, you know Grand Rapids Community College against the world, but that there are really smart people around the world here. Martin Koldorf, who identifies as a socialist, he's you know from Harvard, who designed the VAERS system for CDC, is coming out and saying, "This, what is this? This is trash. This is not science. And that's when I realized something really sinister is going on here. Beyond politics, it violates the Venn diagram of our politics. I'm, I'm pen pals with Naomi Wolf now. That's something, if you had that on your bingo card when I got into this business, I would have never, you win. I'd have never... I'd have never guessed that one, okay? I'd have never guessed that my inbox would be full of people. Have you read RFK Jr. stuff? Not really, no, okay? But that's that shows you how comprehensive and systemic this evil is, that it transcends our political tribalism here in the West. Because here, a lot of our political tribalism has in, in the West is driven by two things. One is spirituality, all right? I don't believe in the God of the Bible. I believe in another God, or I believe I am God. I can declare my own truth, my own morality, all right? And, and that divide, frankly, I can't breach with you. I can't. I'm not qualified to do that, okay? But there's another divide. And that divide is, is people on the right and left who feared fascism, feared authoritarianism. And on the left, you feared it coming from corporate America. 
And on the right, you feared it coming from the government. Well, lo and behold, what did we see here in the last 28 months? Did it come from the government or did it come from the corporations? Yes, was the answer. And that is the classic definition of fascism. And that's where you've seen this very unique political coalition where Robert Malone, proud two-time Obama voter, is talking about, you know, I had a great conversation with Glenn Youngkin the other day, okay? It's because this has blown up the political paradigm that divided a lot of people on both sides because you're seeing that big business and big government have decided they don't have to fight anymore like they did in the 80s and 90s. They're just in bed together. And that's why when Biden wanted to impose his immoral, evil jab mandate, he had he used as his stormtroopers corporations. <laughs> this is uh, I think this is going to be something of a black pill to a lot of people, Steve. Uh, so y- y- you are suspicious from day one. Uh, what What is your progression as this goes along? How vocal are you as of how early and what are your sources to substantiate your cynicism before other people had turned that curve? The, after the uh, the first week of the lockdown, so the first thing I needed to do is, in this era, you know, there's there's an advantage and disadvantage to being associated with such a large platform as the Blaze, and the va- advantages way outweigh the disadvantages because it's hard because you've got a major organization backing you up if they try to censor you, ban you, things of that nature. But there's always a trade off, and and the downside was if I go out way out over here. And you got to remember, I mean, Mark Levin at this time early on is doing interviews with Anthony Fauci, okay? And a lot of our people are getting downloads from the Trump White House about how terrible this is, okay? And so everybody's going to zig and I'm going to zag. And I'm not Mark Levin, you know? I'm not Glenn Beck. I'm not Steven Crowder. I'm, you know, I'm on the JV team here. And and so um, is my show really worth getting everybody disbanded and disbarred and deplatformed? And so... I made the decision first, guys, on my own. And, you know, the Blaze is great. They never have tried to edit me or anything of that nature. The, at the Blaze, it comes down to this. Can you prove what you believe and can you make money? Yes, yes, cool. Say what you want. No, then you're out. I, that's a great standard. I don't know about you guys. I'm totally fine with it. I think that's about as fair as it can get, right? Okay. So, But I made the decision on my own. I went to our president, Tyler Carden. I went to um, uh, uh, or our chairman, Tyler Carden, and our president, Gaston Mooney. And I spent the first weekend of, of, of lockdowns really selling them that I could be right, all right, that, this, this, that you could intellectually and credibly make this argument with all of the data that we were seeing coming out of Italy, the data we were seeing coming out of Spain. And, and, and I lined up all of these sources, Sunetre Gupta at Oxford University, Tony Katz at Yale, Harvey Risch at Yale, John Edenitis, Jay Bhattacharya at Stanford. I lined all these names up, okay? to show them I'm not nuts. And I said, let's just start by asking a simple question because the entire talking point was two weeks to flatten the curve. So here's a question that I had because we were showing all these people, including on Fox, these graphics that made it look like coronavirus was not here on March 15th. And then on March 18th, it suddenly showed up and it's exploding like the walking dead. Really, how do I flatten a curve? And this is the first question I asked. How do we flatten a curve if you don't know when it began? If you go back and look at CDC data in February leading up to the shutdowns in March, we were over the epidemic line for flu two different times during that period of time. Is it possible that the, that the virus was here the entire time and we had no code for it, no way to test for it? And so we were, since it's a respiratory virus like the flu, we were just coding it as the flu. And oh, by the way, when Debbie Burks came up with her map at the Trump White House on how we could reopen, what did, they, what did they tell you and how did they describe COVID after months of saying it's not the flu? They described it as influenza-like symptoms, I-L-S, being the hacks they are. They went with exactly what they told us we could not say from the very beginning, all right? But I wanted to sell our management because I knew if I went out there, it could discredit our entire platform if I was wrong. And I mean, if I can't convince the two guys that have the most vested interest in my success that I might be onto something, I've got no chance to win the argument. And what's funny now is our chairman, our, our CEO, Tyler, I mean, he's more radicalized than me, man. OK, like he's one of the few people I know that can actually speak fluent ethical skeptic. That guy speaks at a level above me most times. OK, I don't understand. Um, I, it, he now sends me stuff before I see it now. All right. Mm-hmm. He's been completely beyond red pilled on this. But 
But I wanted to make sure that our management understood where I was coming from and thought it was credible. And I started from there. And I always have focused on one area at a time. All right. Because I, when I got into this, guys, I didn't know what a T-cell was from a T-bone. And I never thought I was ever going to discuss seroprevalence surveys on the air. All right. That's not what I got into this to do. And so we started very, you know, lockdowns, dig in, really dig in on that. Know the material, know the issues, study it. All right. And then when masks became a thing, we did that with masks. And then when the jab emerged, we did that with the jab. And then when the jab went from limited efficacy against Delta to ne- to, to down negative e- efficacy from Omicron onward, with since it's leaky uh, and you know um, likely a depopulation scheme. Whoops, did I say it? Yes. Um, and so because of all these things, I did this all one thing at a time. If I had tried to spray buckshot on all these things simultaneously, um, I, I there's no way I'd have been I'd have been a mile wide and an inch deep. I would have, uh, you know, played myself. I would have said things that weren't incorrect, gotten caught, gotten censored. And I think the reason why I've been able to survive so far when so many have not is, is almost the entire time I've used their own data, their own data that they publish, uh, their own data that they publish is damaging enough before we even get into the stuff that people like Steve Kirsch and a lot of these people that have unfortunately been relegated to Substack. Before we even get into the stuff they uncover, their own data that they put in their own media sources is bad enough. And that's what I've done is I've just hoisted them from their own petards. Now, I know the day will come. I will log on and they will say enough is enough. OK, but until then, I'm going to rack up as much of their body count as I possibly can. What are some of the solutions uh, that you recommend and discuss in the book and that you've also talked about in general and what are the hurdles, in particular, the uh, vestigial legacy establishment Republican dominance of the party at a congressional level? That last question is much easier to answer. You know, one of the one of the proverbs, creeds we have on our show is the following statement. We are not a nation of laws and we never have been. We are a nation of political will and we always will be. OK. And, and so that's really that's that's the that's the difficulty. Do we have the will to do what must be done? All right. Now, before we give a compliment to the greatest generation, they had to firsthand witness some of the most abhorrent acts in the history of humanity to get that level of will. Okay, and and I pray we don't have to. But I worry that's the human condition going back to the garden, man. Adam just kind of stands there while the serpent is tempting Eve. Just I got nothing. And that's kind of what we do. We wait to the last possible minute and then we blame somebody else when we don't act. That's kind of the story of the human species. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do with this book. It, that's why I don't play a lot. In, I, when I first started doing this show, I was very involved in primaries all over the country, trying to get the best guys elected. I don't do that anymore because everybody I thought was the great guy almost always lost. And I realized the people are the problem. They've got to be radicalized. It's going to be much, it's, it, it, we got to radicalize the people before we get the kinds of mobilized candidates um, that we that we need and desire. And so- This book is designed to radicalize the readership and demand more. That's government by the consent of the governed. Demand more from their elected leaders, because that's the answer to your whole question. Our appendix has a very long uh, and detailed plan of specific policies that could be pursued on a federal and state level so this never happens again. But before we get there, there's a reason why that's in the appendix. And the testimonies and the witnesses are the bulk of the book. You need to be radicalized if you're watching me right now. You need to be radicalized to demand action from your elected officials. Because I promise you, if you are not adequately radicalized, they will not have the will to do what must be done here. I mean, you can't even get you can't even get all the Republicans. I mean, I, I gosh, those were the days where they would say the stuff we wanted them to say and then would screw us after they got elected. They don't even do that now. You can't even get all the Republicans to say, uh, you know, uh, Third Reich uh, raids of the Mar-a-Lago, uh, you know, in the dead of night are bad. All right. Uh, you, 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 current presidents shouldn't be raiding the offices of former presidents. That's a bad that's a bad precedent. We can't even get I'm, I'm not I'm talking like some of the most powerful Republicans in the country. Won't, we can't even get to say that you can't get ditch uh, old, co- old, co- old cocaine Mitch, though, to say uh, the most important air show in the country is Ukraine. OK, you can't get him to say that. All right. But you can't get them to say a damn word about what the the stunt that they pulled at the Mar-a-Lago earlier this week. That you you, you and, and and who's even trying to challenge him for majority leader if they win the if they win it back? No one. 
That's why our people need to be radicalized. And so the bulk of this book is to radicalize you. And then you can take that appendix with those exhaustive policy solutions to your elected representative, and you cannot take no for an answer. Well, By the way, ask you, someone asked, uh, you know, I assume there will be an audio book, and I assume you'll be doing the audio book. There will be an audio product. I won't say for sure there will be an audio book because we are considering doing something original uh, that, that will include the content of the book. Uh, but there will certainly be an audio product. And in the end, we might just decide to go and do a traditional audio book, but there will be an audio product for sure. Now, Steve, I'm going to ask you this question, not just to cover my own tushy, but the sense in which you're using the term radicalized. Mm -hmm. uh, now, because we, we think of Antifa radicals, BLM radicals, sure. people right. prone to violence. So, what, I mean, because I, I like the idea. I think you mean incentivized, uh, educated, and angry. But how do you mean the term radicalized and how do you go about doing it without turning people off simply by virtue of using the term radicalized? Sure. Um, the last question is a good one, but we live in an age where if I judge all of my terminologies about what will turn people off, I won't say a word. I mean, we'll just the next term will turn people off. Right. But the gist of your question is key and vital. And, you know, in Christianity, in, within Christian tradition, we have what is called just war theory. And it lays out a few moral precepts. Now, in the Christian ethic, self-defense is always justifiable. Okay, so like we're sitting here in Red Dawn, all right, and you know, and 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 the Russians and the Cubans start dropping paratroopers while you're at your rural high school. You are perfectly within your Christian grounds to to shout Wolverines and form your militia. Okay, but short of self-defense and and any other form of conflict, there is a just war metric that Christians have to because ultimately. You have to make sure the value of the cause rises above the collateral damage that it may that may ensue. And that goes for culture wars, too. And that's what I'm talking about here. I, I am talking about peace, aggressiveness, but peaceable. How does that look? I'll give you some historical examples. Uh, that's Martin Luther. Uh, that's Martin Luther that, that, that says at his trial, here I, no, I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no more. May God have mercy on my soul. Do your worst. Bring it on. OK, I'm willing to suffer for what I believe. You know, going back to our Lord, there's a pretty long and cherished traditions of uh, Christians being willing to suffer for what they believe and winning out by enduring that suffering in the end. And now we think Aunt Petunia ripping us in our Facebook page. That's suffering we just can't endure. We think losing a job that we probably hate anyway. That's just suffering we can't endure. And since we can't endure any suffering, they make us suffer. That's the way it works. OK, but suff being willing to suffer for what you believe. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said that it was the woman, the 29 year old Baptist seamstress that got on the bus one day in Alabama, just a tiny little bit, a little bitty thing. And they told her to sit on the back of the bus. And she finally wasn't having it after a bad day at work. And she looked at them and, he, and she said one simple word. No. And then that was the spark that really lit the rest of the civil rights movement An unwillingness to be governed by the spirit of the age. That's what I'm urging my audience to do right now. Be ungovernable by the spirit of the age. Let me give you a specific example of what I mean. So right now, only about 2% of Americans have injected their, their toddlers with that, uh, 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 I guess we'll call it uh, jab. Only 2%. That's key because I promise you, if the number was 20 or 30%, here's what they would have done. They would have said, you cannot send your kid to any education building this fall that receives federal funding if you don't get it jabbed, that includes preschools that take Head Start. I promise you they would have done this because they would have figured, hey, we're starting with a baseline of 25 percent. We just go back and go on at CNN and MSNBC and lie to our people to get another 10 or 15. And then another 10 or 15 will just do it because they're desperate to put their kids in school. And bam, we got a majority. Then we turn around and we and we make you the other who won't comply. And that's our game plan. Right. It's always you're a racist. You're a misogynist. You're a xeno, you're the other. OK, they would have done that. But they can't start from a baseline of 2% and get there. And so they just couldn't do it. Los Angeles County was going to issue an indoor mask mandate last month. The wealthy communities of Burbank and Beverly Hills told them, yeah, screw that noise. We're not doing it. And then all of a sudden they realized we can't enforce it. So we won't do it. Become ungovernable by the spirit of the age. Make these things impossible to enforce. There's a reason why cops don't sit on a highway counting every last person not winning wearing a seatbelt. You're going too fast. They couldn't see. How many people could they actually turn over? By the way, I'm not advocating not wearing a seatbelt. I wear one. I'm just making a point. 
you we have to show we will not comply with these things. When they got Trump to basically surrender his presidency to COVID, right? When they got us to wear their Chinese face diapers that don't work, when they got us to take their jabs that don't work to get a job. When they got us to shut down our churches, but the liquor stores stayed open and we shut our churches down for a virus we weren't spreading, but the Rainbow Church stays open despite the virus it is spreading. When we showed them that level of ass, we just literally raised up our skirts, showed them our ass and showed them we were weak, 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 weak. How did you expect bullies to respond? Maybe I just think differently. I was raised by a bully, so I'm a subject matter expert on them. And I can just promise you, bullies never go away voluntarily. You show them weakness, they will come back again and again and again and again. They pick on the weak. That's what they do. And so we showed them, and Trump showed them an immense amount of weakness here the last couple of years. Hell, he's still out there promoting their poison program like he's the Winston Churchill of COVID, okay? As long as you continue to do this, they will continue to push you further. We need to show we're not afraid of you, and we don't have to revolt. We're just simply not going to comply. And we don't believe 20 dads, not one, not one mama bear, 20 dads in San Diego at that school district show up the first day of school with their kids unmasked and they sit, they grab a lawn chair, flip it down. And they sit in that lobby of that school and say, yeah, you won't be masking our kids today. Just want to make sure we send that message. And you tell, and you, and you send a message to that 375 pounds rent a cop sitting there with the badge. Yeah, go ahead. See if you, go ahead and try to see if you can uh, kick all of us out of here. We're your huckleberry. Go ahead. That's what I'm talking about a refusal to comply, dare them to enforce it. Show them that and, and say, hey, we're running tape. I'm running my camera on video right now. This is gonna be on the Steve Day Show. This is gonna be on Sidebar tonight. Smile, you're about to be famous, Goose Stepper. How you like them apples? All the neighborhood will know, the whole cul-de-sac will know, you're the douchebag, all right? We need to do things like this. If we don't do things like this peaceably, aggressively, this is my fear. I am an ugly American. Tonight, after I get done with you here in a few minutes, I'm going to my small group. When I get home, all right, um, I will probably enjoy conjugal relations with my wife. She will go to bed, okay? And then I will come down to the man cave and play MLB the show so my Detroit Tigers might actually win a game or three this season, all right? I'm an ugly American. I'm counting down the days to the college football season. OK, I love the conveniences and accoutrements of being an American. I love arguing about Marvel movies and everything else. So when I say this, what I'm about to say, it's with that as the context. My fear is we're about to blow all of that. And my fear is that if we don't learn how to peaceably but aggressively confront the spirit of the age, we are going to sentence our children and grandchildren to have to confront it in ways that history books are written about. If you do the math. If you prorate the amount of Americans that died in the Civil War to our current population trend, guys, it's over 6 million people. I don't want to see that happen. But we are heading to a point of no return of irreconcilable cultures. Unless we figure out and show the other side that there will be cultural and political pain that you will feel for doing this. And so we have mutually assured destruction. Don't do it. And I'll close my answer with this. Reagan did not do the arms buildup in the 80s because he thought he could win a nuclear war, but because he knew he could not. And there were crazies in the Kremlin that after 30 years of American weakness, they thought they could win one. They thought they might hit a first strike. Let's hit New York and you guys might surrender and we're out of here. And it's a toast, comrades. We needed to show them you cannot win. So don't launch. No one can win. Like the movie War Games. The only way to win the game is not to play. We need to show the other side. You do not have unilateral rights to persecute us, to shun us and cancel us anymore. We will use the same system and punch you back until you stop. And then when you stop, we'll go back to what, how this used to be. We kill each other at the ballot box and no one gives a rip at the Little League field who you voted for. Just watch the damn game and cheer on the kids. 
The I only have uh, one more question because I don't want to be put on a, uh, uh, any backsliders list at the, the local small group prayer section. As uh, <laughs> I figured out, my my mom, I you figured out years later, I was like, she's putting on people that she's unhappy about on the backslider. It's like, oh, that person offended me. She got added to the backsliders list. That's spoken like a good Baptist right there. The backslider uh, list. I hear you, brother. I'm feeling oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Grew up in that tradition. And someday we'll talk about sports and sports betting. I mean, one place, if you have sports betting success as you've had, one of the things you learn is not to trust algorithms and models. Everybody's Correct. got a new algorithm and model, and it's the inputs yep. that matter, not the outputs that matter. Yep. But one of the questions from our VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com chat was, what in the right now gives you hope and heart for the future of America? The number one thing that gives me hope and heart is this. There's not as many of us as we would want, and maybe not as many of us right now as we need. But there's a lot more of us than they had counted on. When this occurred in Western Europe, the church had already fully abrogated its position of influence in the culture. Uh, they were already disarmed. And so at that point, you know, it's literally Hitler just running through the Champs Elysees after the French have surrendered. It's over. All right. This is just making it official, but it was over before this. If you go to Europe right now, uh, you know, 2% of France is, uh, is evangelical. Many of the old great Catholic uh, cathedrals of, of old, um, uh, they're now mosques or shopping malls or they're empty. OK, even in our diminished state, the church still has a tremendous amount of influence that it wields in the culture. That's why they're always trying to discredit Christian voters, you know, religious right, uh, Christian right, white, white nationalist, whatever the term de jour is every decade, they they they, they recalibrate a new one. OK. So there is still a still a tremendous amount of influence with th that the church has in the culture. And there are uh, still many of us armed. And that is somewhat of a deterrent. Now, I don't think it's a deterrent against the spirit of the age, but I do think it's a deterrent maybe against your local sheriff when he's given orders from on high. Hey, you're the ones that have to implement these edicts may not be so easy to be just following orders when you know how armed your populace and citizenry are. And so. You know, to me, an armed citizenry is insurance. You have that so that you don't ever have to use it, right? And I, we have more of that than than any other Western nation did before it basically just gave itself over to the spirit of the age. And that is my hope. If they had complete and total hegemony right now, like they brag about, guys, they wouldn't have to lie, cheat, and steal elections. They don't, all right? It was just a few years ago when Donald Trump took over in January of 2017, we had fewer Democrats in elected office in this country nationwide, federal, state, and local, than we had since before the Great Depression. Even the media, the all-powerful media that they dominate, that number still was true when he took over, all right? They are much more vulnerable than they let on. If you look at the history of the Christian church, Caesar always begins creating martyrs and persecuting when he's, when he's at the end, when he's cornered. When he no longer has the upper hand, the, the moral high ground in the culture, and that's the last card to play. And that's the card they're starting to play right now. And that shows one of two things is true, or maybe a little bit of both. That either A, they really don't have the dominance they thought, or B, they're concerned that their window to acquire that dominance is closing, and so they have to act fast right now. Either one or a little bit of both, that shows vulnerability on their part. We have the numbers. It's just a matter of whether we have the conviction. Thanks, Steve. Uh, th Steve. The, uh, this was great. It's fantastic. We're going to stick around, but Steve, thank you very much, and, and we'll, we'll keep in touch. This is you amazing. bet. We'll do it again sometime, guys. God bless. Take All care. Right. Absolutely. Have a good night. Okay. Robert, <clears throat> let me just switch the sides here so I can go back to our ordinary sides. That was uh, incredible. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a natural. Yeah, very much in the, the Rush Limbaugh kind of spirit. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk radio's a school of, uh, of style and communication to a, to a substantial degree. Uh, you know, I knew him as the Michigan podcast guy. So the uh, uh, before I knew him as in politics, he came on the political scene when or, or, or I'm sorry, he came on my awareness of his uh, political role uh, during the covid lockdowns because he was one of the first to be hyper, to be very critical of where this was going, the direction, take apart the, the data, challenge and contest the assumptions, note the ideological orientations of a lot of the people propagating the data. Uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, and, and this obviously with his book and it's, it's, it's uh, the topic that's most of concern to him currently uh, made sense to to focus and, and, and center on that. 
Well, he he said something that immediately made me feel stupid. Like like that that troll out of three hundred where he said, "May you live forever," and it immediately made him feel guilty. He said, how do you measure two weeks to flatten the curve when you don't know what to start the two weeks from? And now I feel like an idiot, like a, like a child who didn't even ask the most obvious question. Or unless, you know, we all just took for granted. If we start two weeks today, we'll kill it in its tracks. It's like applying a, a ant killer to windows for no yeah. particular reason. Uh, Barnes, Robert, let me get some super chats just before we get yeah. into some discussion that we have to have. Uh, Re, okay, thank you. Please tell me you didn't cut that magnificent mane. I did not. I took a shower. It's all there. I brushed it. Uh, there's going to be a... Okay, sorry. I don't... Okay, I, <laughs> I know Rakeda says things. Uh, okay, geez, Louise. <laughs> Let me see if I can get past these. Okay, if I ever see a man bun on Viva, I'm going to quit. Hair back with ponytail. Yes, a lot of hair stuff. Wait, this isn't Eric from The Blaze unless you shaved. Okay, no, it's not. Okay, we'll get there. So t- Trump does have documents. The question is whether he was legally allowed to have and did he tamper with them? We're going to get here in two seconds. Uh, Department of J ordered to unseal the warrant. Robert, we're going to get into the um, the most uh, up-to-date stuff of what's going on. I read the first chapter of Dace's, Dace's new book this afternoon. Wow. So much new info, even for regular v- viewers of his like I am. Dace knows his stuff and comes with the proof. Can't wait for the full book release in the fall. Corn Pop is not... Corn Pop wasn't a bad dude. Okay. Jeez, <laughs> Louise. Corn Pop's in the house. Uh, just a few more to stop the spread of monkeypox. I will not finish the rest of that super chat. Here, Steve always reminds us that a Christian worldview begins with the premises. The premise, Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb on the third day and defeated death. Having it delivered from Steve resonated with me and has started me changing my life. Thank you, Steve. I'm not a religious person, people, but I definitely appreciate it. Ruby is in the house. I am also an activist. Free the curls. Done. Little Rock says, I have a signed copy of all of Glenn's book. Will Steve be putting out the opportunity to purchase signed copies of the book? He'll see this and we'll see afterwards. Okay. And then we got uh, Barnes. I'm a certified pool operator. I have seen more hair, clumps of it, in the swimming pools I service than ever before. Do you think the jab could have had anything to do with it? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, it might be that people were at home swimming more. It might be that long COVID causes hair loss. Who knows? Uh, Viva. Okay, this is it, Robert. Can you debrief us? I didn't want... Steve, I don't, I'm, I'm not uh, that familiar with this topic. There, there was... I saw um, not a podcast. I saw, a, a, I saw an internet video um, of a guy going through it. I have to remember what it was. And we'll get to it. Okay. Thank you. Homework. Uh, not homework, but housekeeping done. Robert. Uh, the Oh, just one other one from the Locals Live chat about the uh, University of Michigan had a program since 1970 on environmental teach-ins, talking about that that part of the agenda being an older, uh, well-established agenda. In fact, our SNR conservation class actually got credit for it. That's interesting. The uh, There's a breaking story that the FBI ordered cameras turned off during the Mar-a-Lago raid. I've seen that story. I got about 10 minutes because I just have a, I got a legal brief that I'm working on tonight. Okay. And, and then I'll, I'll maybe after Barnes leaves, I'll yeah. just read a few of the rumble rants. Robert, give us the, give us the latest that, that you know of. I have someone sneaking in again here, Robert. Uh, what, one thing that I think a lot of people are running as talking points today, they went after Hillary. They were ruthless. Now they're defending Trump. Can you explain the difference between a secretary of state mishandling classified information and the president, the head of the executive, and what rights he might have as relates to executive privilege? Yeah, it's it's not uh, really analogous. I mean, even though Hillary was taking, you know, was taking shots at, you know, putting out a photo of her with a hat that said butter emails. So she was just making a crock out of the double standard that was applied. So in Hillary's case, while she was secretary of state, she was doing business that she didn't want the world to know about. So she did not keep those records on State Department servers and had an off-server location to basically secretly communicate government business. That was the major violation. Then when it was uncovered and discovered, her reaction was to delete it and destroy the evidence that would further implicate whatever she was up to. It, so very completely different. Uh, Whereas as the president, under the Presidential Records Act, a lot of those records are the president's records. In fact, they all are. Some of the records uh, stay in custody for a period of time with the National Archives, um, and then they go back to the president. So these are all his records, his right to have these records, so on and so forth. 
um, the if he uh, he could have declassified anything he wanted while he was president. If there were records, he chose not to declassify, but keep a copy of that. This happens with almost every president. Then they negotiate exactly who's going to have the records for certain periods of time. But uh, I think that what I said at the on the the night of the raid at uh, Bourbon with Barnes at VivaBarnesLaw.locals.com uh, has held up pretty well. Which, uh, in fact, it's held up very well. Which was my view was that this was not related to January sixth. That this was not in anticipation of an indictment, but was entirely because my guess was Trump has documents uh, that they don't want Trump to have, that they don't want Trump to share with anyone else. And that I suspect they don't want any copies to exist of. And Paul Speary, an investigative reporter for Real Clear Politics, put out a tweet to that same effect about a, you know, a day later after I had uh, hypothesized this. And then he was immediately taken off of Twitter. And so uh, we're getting more confirmation. And they didn't allow the lawyers to see the warrant. They didn't allow people to see what they were trying to take. They didn't allow that they apparently turned the cameras off. All of this is evidence of a deep state operation with Democratic Party blessing because of the political decision makers involved. Uh, uh, Attorney General Garland would have had to have signed off on this. Uh, but I don't think it was a uh, in primarily a Democratic Party operation. I think it was primarily a deep state operation. And I think uh, if you know Trump being Trump was probably smart, kept certain information and documents that prove that information with him after he left, that uh, would be very embarrassing to certain deep state operators to have published to the world. And they uh, tried other means to try to get it back under the guise of archives. And, uh, the, and uh, they used a federal magistrate who was a, who, I mean, it, it, when I say that there are deep state judges, this federal magistrate is what I'm talking about. So here's a guy who's in the U.S. Department of Justice. When the Epstein case begins, when there's you know basis for criminal investigation, he then leaves the Justice Department and goes to work for Epstein and Epstein uh, affiliates, helps defend him, helps many people believe used inside information from the Justice Department to help make sure Epstein got protected and a bunch of people around Epstein got protected. Then gets re- uh, then later defends other deep state apparatus, including Lois Lerner, who, by the way, was, you know, contempt of Congress, not answering information, politically weaponizing the IRS, destroying documents that could prove her case. He defended her as there was no problem with that. Gets the federal judges, because that's who chooses to appoint magistrates, not the president, uh, the federal judges to appoint him to become magistrate, is on the Trump versus Clinton case and has to recuse and disqualify himself, which federal judges almost never do, because it's so his partisan bias is so, and his political connections to the Clintons are so deep and so egregious that he can't continue to maintain face and continue to be part of the case. And then two weeks later, he's the one who signs this warrant, unprecedented, historically unprecedented warrant, and this has never happened before in American legal history, to break into the president's and raid, uh, the, the media doesn't want to call it that court court appointed search court approved search warrant is the approved language uh, in ordinary parlance. It's called raid and sack because that's what it was. Uh, and I think the reason is that Trump as insurance against indictment, against assassination, against other risks that might be out there against them trying to take him out politically, kept some documents that are very embarrassing to corrupt deep state actors in D.C., and if, you know, the, my favorite part of this story so far, uh, aside from the great political blowback we're seeing from the American people, seeing how outrageous and outlandish this is, is that, you know, they were all excited. They apparently didn't find what they were looking for and ransacking everything. So they bring in a safe cracker, break open Trump's space. They're, they, you know, safe. They, they got him now. They, you know, he's DOA. Trump even implied this by saying, man, they cracked open my safe. Uh, Viva will be back in a second. And what what do they actually find? The safe, like Geraldo Rivera and Al Capone's safe, is empty. So uh, it may be the case that Trump was smart enough not to have those documents down there. So they might have done all of this, caused all this blowback, all this political disaster. The Democrats got a sneak peek of what it would look like if they actually tried to indict Trump. It will be a massive political blowback, not only across the country, but 
There were I was talking about it with the Duran. It's all across the globe. People are like, hold on a second. You know, the uh, even there's some banana republics that aren't this banana. <laughs> and so the uh, uh, I think that they realize that going after him will backfire badly. There was some myth, Mark Elias, that Democratic hack lawyer who helped do the election fornication in 2020, uh, what put out said, hey, we can use this to prevent Trump from running. Congress can't do that. Uh, the Constitution controls the qualifications for election to the presidency. Uh, they they can't by some, it wouldn't matter if he was convicted of this, they can't disqualify him. Eugene V. Debs ran for the president while he was in prison. So the you can't, uh, uh, Congress can't dictate that. All that matters is where you are. Are you a natural born citizen? Are you 35 years of age? Uh, I think there's, I forget the other component. There's like residency component, but I may be getting confused. But that's it, basically. Are you natural born? Are you 35? Boom. You can run for president. Uh, natural born American. So that's it. They can't, they can't keep them off the ballot. They can't keep them out of the White House uh, that, that by these shenanigans. They can only destroy their own credibility by escalating and accelerating in this area. But I think what it shows is Trump was smart and savvy and has some information that's damaging to the deep state that he's keeping in his back pocket, just not in his safe at Mar-a-Lago. And Robert, a little rock, who's also a lawyer, wants me to ask. Viva Asboards, if I'm right, the statute appears to give the president five years to go yeah. through those yeah. records. And that's why it's always constantly part of a dispute. And ultimately, it goes back to the president anyway. So the uh, if anybody thinks the National Archives was the one behind this, I got another thing coming. I mean, now... There's some deep state allies at the National Archives, no doubt about that. But everything about this screams deep state operation that was willing to allow blowback on the Democratic Party, their current allies, uh, because they were so eager to get whatever it was Trump had. And my bet is they didn't have it and they didn't find it. Um, hypothetically, if... Uh, Trump had declassified when he was president. What's the process through which to confirm declassification? Um, my guess is he didn't declassify it. So the uh, that he did, there there was some people that believe that he chose at the end not to classify certain information. That here's what may have happened. Trump may I know part of this did happen. Trump called everybody in and said from all the different agencies, CIA, NSA, FBI, etc., and said uh, what should I really not declassify. And they gave him, you know, don't whatever you do, don't declassify this. You may have thought, ah, I'm going to take a little copy of that. So because apparently that's what scares you guys so much. That's, uh, and there might have been information. He didn't declassify certain things about Spygate and so on and so forth. So the, he had the legal right to declassify. It shows it's not like somebody stealing secrets and any of that gibberish. He didn't violate the law. That, that's, that's just, he, didn't, he, he was lawfully entitled to these documents uh, is my conclusion. Also, there's no way in God's green earth, if my premise is right, they are ever going to want a public trial on what the documents are. <laughs> so uh, you, this won't accelerate in ways that they think. But it may have also been on the Democratic side a test to see if they could escalate criminal actions against the president and, and to the, the former president and future president. And if, they, if that was their test, it backfired badly. When you get your institutional conservatives, your Grassleys, your other people uh, saying this is outrageous, and even talking about maybe it's time to disband the FBI, then they're getting a sense of, oh, they can't go any further. They go any further, the political tidal wave will, will, will sweep them under. So the key was the massive public outrage, because I do think the Democratic side of this operation was to test whether or not they could weaponize the criminal justice system, even against their future presidential opponent and likely future president. Uh, and to clarify one point, which I think you made a good point on, the judge recused himself from the civil file between Trump and the Clintons, not because of a conflict with Trump necessarily, but with the Clintons, so he could still sit in a, he could still be a judge oh, in a file. Words, once you're that deeply aligned with the Democratic Party, you can't preside over any Trump case, period. You know, he had to withdraw from any Trump case, definitely this case. You know, so that was that showed a deep ethical breach. The court systems appear to kind of know it and they're still covering for him. They took down his biography, apparently, off the judicial website. I've never seen that before, ever. So this exposes 
parts of the federal judiciary's corruption, much by the way, like the Ellsberg case did. The federal judge presiding over that case was talking about getting a sweetheart deal in the, in the Nixon administration in exchange for making sure the trial went a certain way. That information became public. That's partially why Ellsberg never went to prison. So there's a long history of, of, of deep state corruption. The movie we're going to talk about this Friday at VivaBarnesLaw.locals.com is a civil action that talks about how it works in the corporate realm. So, the, uh, uh, so I think it exposed a lot of Americans were still shocked because they've been a little, some Americans still been uh, asleep at the wheel at the complete and utter weaponization of the legal system, civil and criminal, civil as revealed in the Alex Jones case, criminal as revealed in the uh, Donald Trump case, that uh, that this is off the charts insane. They want to weaponize anything and everything. The ends justify the means. They want to see how much they can get away with. And they'll start with Trump and then go to everybody. Ultimately, anyone that's a dissident, because if they're willing to do it to Trump, they're by golly willing to do it to anybody. So credit. I also think they thought Trump would never tell anybody this happened. They went in in plain clothes. They tried to keep it low key. They probably never planned on disclosing to anybody they had done it. Probably thought Trump would be too embarrassed to disclose it. Trump was ready to flip the script on him right away. And so they, un- they again, misread and under- underrated Trump. They also misread and underrated the American political appetite for this kind of overt political partisan weaponization of the criminal justice process. The only people really supporting this at this point are hack Republicans and Democratic Party loyalists. Everyone else is like, whoa, this went too far. Uh, Robert, here, actually, I'll I'll bring up a tweet in a second because you just raised another point that I didn't think about. Any word about Scott Perry's phone? Uh, what's what's going on there? The day I uh, leader of the Freedom Caucus's phone, uh, who's been challenging FBI corruption the day after the Trump raid. So the uh, uh, it, it's 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 accelerating in ways that is just going to backfire on them in major ways. I mean, the that the, it reveals the need for institutional reform. And hopefully that will be the net effect of this illicit action, much as the NSA spying on Frank Church led Frank Church to ultimately, when he got the opportunity, lead the church community, the church committee, expose MK Ultra, expose assassinations, expose CIA bad acts, expose COINTELPRO. All that came from Frank Church because they went too far and spied on him. Uh, I think they went way too far. They tried, they crossed a Rubicon that may be the end of the, uh, of deep state control of certain law enforcement institutions over the next two, three years, because the blowback is coming and it's big. Now, and you mentioned it, Robert. Uh, I'll pull up this tweet from RJ. Now it, it takes on new meaning. Bruce Reinhardt's page came down today after he was targeted by Trump supporters. And how, using... how do you target a website by reading it? Well, and not just that, but now uh, like take down his page, take down his description because it revealed stuff that now people are going to be scrutinizing and then hide the fact, or sorry, cloak the fact that it was taken down under the guise that yeah, he was he a, a victim. Trump hating social media commentary. Um, you know, the, uh, but the Epstein and Clinton's, what, well, well, I mean, well, what's the chance? And does anybody really think that's random? The magistrate who gets picked to sign the warrant happens to be the, Ep- an Epstein key Epstein guy happens to be a key Clinton ally happens to have had a history of covering up for major corruption of the deep state. Uh, you know, they went judge shopping and they found the judge that they knew. And if he had any ethical bone in his body, he would have disqualified himself from signing the warrant but this shows how the system is and you know trump sometimes intentionally sometimes accidentally keeps exposing how corrupt and rotten it is and but I, I got yeah, to get back to some work okay robert go i'll, I'll, I'll uh, handle some some rumble rants robert see you see you soon absolutely all right uh that's it's fun it's funny because i brought up that tweet earlier today just to say you know they're making uh the victims the victimizers you know like when they go and raid trump and then he's the one causing the outrage from the raid. When they took down the, the, the judge's web page, I was like, oh, you know, they're, they're making what, you know, to the extent it's lawful, not criminal threats, harassment, anticipated backlash from an arguably partisan judge. They're turning him into the victim. Robert mentions, you know, what was described in his bio and now people are piecing it together. And so they, they take down the bio, but cloak it under the fact that it was done to protect the judge because he was being harassed. Well, isn't that convenient, to quote the church lady? Um, that Steve Dace sidebar was fire. It was absolute fire. I love the idea of fighting against the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist. Uh, I, you know, I, 
I, I, I'm not a religious person, but I can, ex I, I like and respect religious principles uh, and the religious allegories, whether or not, whether you take them literally, that's one thing, none of my business. As metaphors, as to how to guide one's life, they're beautiful, they're powerful, they're meaningful. Now, I did notice some rumble rants on the rumbles. Let me see here. Polycarp the seventh says, I love this show and I concur. Kay Kaufman says, no branch Covidians here. Uh, and then Hunt for the Truth says, flashback, Steve says he'll never vote for the president in 16 on MSNBC. And then there's a link to a YouTube video. Um, that was phenomenal. Let's just, let's just see what's in the chat. Uh, yeah, the door, the door, the door was, no, the door's open. Uh, and I, and I could hear stomping around upstairs. So, I, I mean, I don't know what's up with uh, Rick Scott's phone seizure. I, I now appreciate Barnes's. I don't like people even talking about the idea of assassination insurance. Like, I mean, I, I, there was there was somebody talking about that today, saying, you know, if this doesn't work, then on on Fox News, it was it was one of the mainstream outlets. If this if this raid doesn't work on keeping Trump off the ballot, uh, they're going to resort to the most extreme. I don't like people even talking about that. I don't like the, you know, putting that mojo out in the universe. So when Robert says, you know, this was insurance against the deep state, I don't like it. I don't like it. It's um, when you fight corruption, corruption fights back. I do want to end this stream just on, just on one thing, just on one thing, which we might have forgotten about once upon a time. Save, we'll save some more discussion for tomorrow. Uh, let's just see if I can find the clip real fast. Is this it? I may not be able to get... Uh, when did... Truck Schumer, Trump, Revenge, FBI. Come on. Well, I'm not going to find it to end it, but you know, you know, he said the thing with the thing. The FBI can find, what did he say, six ways from Sunday to get back at you if they don't like you about Trump? Hmm. So it's almost like they're telling you what they're doing while they do it, but then as it happens, they're telling you that they're not doing what they just said they were going to do if you didn't play ball. It was the CIA, whatever. Okay, so it's one, it's one or the other, the intelligence, uh, but it's, it's, it's intelligence. Barnes even said that Trump is... I don't like saying, I don't like putting juju, certain juju out in the universe. Viva, will you admit that the Antarctic ice wall is being guarded by NASA space Jew penguins? <laughs> if it is, I didn't get the memo, people. Uh, spiritual warfare come in the opposite spirit. Um, Steve Dace, people, you heard it. It was fantastic. Uh, you know the thing. So, people, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, we're going to go live at some point. The kids are in school. I have daytimes, free and uninterrupted. Back to myself, in theory. But so many things. It, a, a move and reestablishing and starting from zero takes a long time. All right, let me see here what we got here. Love you, Viva. Thank you very much. Not a band account. Did you? Let, let me see. Let me see. Refresh. We're good. We're still good. We'll see what happens afterwards. I, I have a feeling now the Overton window has shifted. That which was once taboo on YouTube is no longer taboo, and the taboo is new stuff. I don't know what the new stuff is just yet, but um, how are kids liking school? Um, it, it, they are enjoying having a normal, untraumatizing childhood. Actual socializing, actual freedom, actual normal human interactions where they no longer have to worry about a backlash if they get into closed quarters, close proximity with another human. Um, oh, yeah. Do we that 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 video from the beginning? Now nah, forget it. We won't even do it. Okay. Heather Ryan says, Thanks, Viva and Barnes, for all your very informative chats. I caught this very late, so going to replay to see what Dace said. Amazing. And he speaks well. He's got a good radio voice, concise, 
Thank you, Viva. You guys rock. All right, go, people. I'm going to go, I guess, put the kids to bed because it's time. Thank you for everything. Just let me make sure that I don't have anything more on the rumble. And, um, okay, we're good. We're good there. We're good. So I'll see you tomorrow. If I don't see you before then, snip, clip, share around. This was one for the ages. I will post it on a uh, podcast. Viva Barnes, Law for the People on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, all that other stuff. Clips go on Viva Clips. So be sure to subscribe to that Viva Clips channel if you're not already. Viva Family for random stuff. And um, let's go. See you tomorrow. Enjoy the night. Peace out, people.